Okay, let's start this session now. Uh, hello guys, good morning and welcome you all in this Gen AI session. Myself, Archie Desai, I'm a host for this session. Guys, if you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We'll be there to help you out. So the event sponsor for this webinar is Synergetics. So Synergetics is a learning India most distinguished learning company in IT technology. We are ready with our top class learning solution that can be made to fit every requirement in every sector across every industry around the globe. Our expensive greenfield solution include that is a persona based onboarding solution, onboarding add-on solution, certification solution, certification add-on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre-sales training solution, and practice playbook solution and architecting solution. So today webinar is organized by the ETC community and sponsored by the Synergetics. Our ETC community, community is open to all the people who are interested in our emerging technology. You just have to follow the uh, Meetup app and you can follow our communities there. Then you have to follow code of conduct. Please note that no one is allowed to take screenshot screenshot of the presentation presentation and cannot do screen recording if you have any technical question related to the topic you can use the chat box to ask your question today speaker for this training is sonu satyadas he is a training consultant and currently work with synergetics as a practice head agenda for this webinar you will get to know about a uh, topic and benefit of it make sure guys you follow us on our linkedin facebook twitter youtube for upcoming webinar details Thank you. Now I would like to hand over this mic our speaker. He will continue ahead. Ah. Thank you, Archie. Hello, everyone. I hope I am audible to all of you. So myself, uh, Sono Satyadas. And uh, I am the assistant manager technology and synergetics, working uh, on various uh, technologies from the last uh, 15 plus years, including the open source cloud AI and uh, .NET technologies. So this uh, session is specifically on the Gen AI. And uh, we, this is the agenda for the session. So we discuss about the Gen AI, that is generative AI, and the importance of generative AI. And we'll uh, understand some of the uh, core deep learning architectures, like uh, GAN, VA, and Transformers. And then, we will discuss about the open AI's GPT model because that is one of the widely used generative AI model. We'll understand its capabilities, uh, its uh, different uh, versions and the differences between each version. And we will see uh, what are the things we can do with the GPT models that the open AI model and we will see some of the uh, practical applications of generative AI in different domains. And finally, we'll be ending up the session with uh, the responsible AI concepts that uh, every AI developer needs to follow. So let's get started. To start with generative AI, we need to understand AI is one of the major technology that we use uh, today. Because nowadays, if you see, compared to any other technologies, in every domain, we are listening the word artificial intelligence, whether it is in a entertainment industry, like movies, or it is in the manufacturing domain, or in the health 
domain or it is in education domain so in every place we are using the artificial intelligence but if you see why it is so popular now is it a new concept no artificial intelligence is not a new type terminology and not a new concept it's initially introduced in 1950s at that time the word artificial intelligence was used to explain the systems that can take intelligent decisions based on the inputs it may be a decision making system expert systems but artificial intelligence got its uh, importance in the it with the introduction of machine learning so in 1990s we started building machine learning models so these machine learning models are trained with millions of data and these models uses some algorithms to learn the data patterns and using this data patterns it can make some predictions or it can take some decisions so if you look into the traditional machine learning models it can be either uh using a classification approach or classification model a regression model or clustering model so there are different uh, types of machine learning models we have so considering the regression model which is primarily used to predict some kind of numerical values for example we need to predict the temperature based on the parameters such as humidity wind direction the date and time and so many other parameters so based on the input parameters we have to predict what can be the temperature for that particular day so temperature is a numeric value or we can use this model to predict the machine learning models can be used to predict the amount of uh sales that may happen or the amount of products that we have to manufacture so how it will predict that numbers because based on the previous years data the model will learn the patterns and it will identify the relationship between those parameters within the data and then do some calculations some mathematical or statistical calculations and then giving you a result for example i have to predict the number of bikes to be rendered for a particular day so if i have a bike bike renting company i have to predict how many bikes i have to rent so i have to rent or i have to keep for rent in the next uh, day so how will predict so people will hire the bike based on different uh, parameters suppose if it is a rainy day they will not use if it is a sunny day they will use or if it is uh, uh, very humid they won't use so there are different uh, parameters that affects the number of bikes that to be rendered so depends on the date time 
temperature, humidity, okay, and other parameters. It will predict how many bikes to be rented. So that number is just a prediction. It can be correct or it can be wrong. But yes, it can give you an approximate uh, value. So we use this machine learning models to predict something or to take decisions, or we can use the machine learning models to uh, classify the uh, data. Maybe if I have a patient, I can use the patient's uh, diagnostic reports, and based on that values, I can classify him as a diabetic person or a non-diabetic person. Okay, so based on his uh, diagnostic re reports or the parameters in the diagnostic reports, like uh, uh, the heartbeat, age, and other parameters, we can predict whether this person comes into diabetic group or non-diabetic group. So these are all predictions which we simply use based on the data. So we provide a large set of data for training the model. The model is learning the patterns from the data. And then whenever the user provides an input parameter or input data set, based on that, it will predict the result. It's a simple predictions it does. But these predictions are very simple operations because it's just predicting a number or it just predict or it just uh, identifying the type of the uh, input data. So that kind of simple calculations it does. That is machine learning. But when the data becomes very complex and the task that we have to achieve becomes very complex, we cannot use simple machine learning models. We have to go for deep learning models. So deep learning models uh, uses a neural network to process the data and then take the decisions or provide the output. For example, I have to analyze a particular image captured from a camera or captured uh, using a camera and identify the different objects from that picture. For example, if there is a uh, camera attached in an ATM counter, it is continuously capturing the photos or videos using that camera and send it to the AI system. AI system will analyze the images or videos and detect the activities of the person who is there inside the ATM counter. So whether he has to uh, wear, he wore any helmet or he is uh, carrying some weapons, okay, or the other or the number of people inside the counter because usually we know that in ATM counters only one person allowed at a time. So from the captured image, we can identify how many people has entered inside the counter and accordingly we can make an announcement or notification message uh, to the security guard or we can alarm saying that only one person is allowed in the, uh, the, the counter. So that requires a complex data processing because it's not just a simple data predictions. It needs to analyze the images, videos, audios okay, using very complicated neural network. So neural network is something similar to our human brain neurons, which process the data at different levels. Similarly, these deep learning models, like uh, computer vision models, speech recognition models, okay, anomaly detection models. 
so they these are some of the examples of deep learning models they will process the data at using different uh, levels using different uh, new uh, neurons and then finally giving you a insight okay suppose if i'm providing an image to an ai model deep learning ai model it can tell you what are the different objects identified in that image how many faces detected in that image it can create a caption for that image it can create tags based on the objects uh, identified in this uh, picture so that means the model is not only simply doing a prediction but also providing lots of information about that captured image or in case of voice recognition or speech recognition systems it will identify the voice and then detect the language and then convert that into text format so you can use the deep learning models for very complex data processing but again these deep learning models also not generating anything it is just to process the given data and just give you the insights about that data but if you see the new member in the artificial intelligence family that is gen ai generative ai can create new fresh contents based on the user instructions so whenever the user ask the generative ai model to create a content the model is able to generate it as a fresh new content for example i can tell the generative ai model to write a story so it will create a fresh new story if you want you can even specify the plot story plot you can tell the characters which is required in the story so anything you can explain so according to your instruction the model will create the story or you can tell the model to draw an image okay you can tell the model okay can you please draw an image of a ship sailing in the ocean and it should be a cloudy sky there should be uh, uh what uh, moon in the sky so that that kind of uh, descriptions you can give according to that descriptions it will draw the image similarly for audio you can provide the script which is which need to be generated as audio or you can provide the instructions which needs to be used for creating the audio so accordingly the model will generate the audio content so you can see you are just giving the instruction and the model is creating a new fresh content so model is creating or generating some new content that's why this models are called the generative ai models so as i have mentioned these gen ai models can create the contents in the form of text image code or audio and how these gen ai models works they are also using the deep learning neural networks or deep learning algorithms which are trained with the millions of data sets and they use some specific deep learning architectures to generate the new data unlike the traditional deep learning models the generative ai models or generative ai um, uh, algorithm architectures are capable to produce some new content so there are different generative ai 
deep learning architectures we use. So some of the uh, generative AI applications, if you see, we use generative AI for text content generation, such as simple uh, article writing or in the chat conversations, summarization of text, text translation process, creating the PowerPoint presentations text, or even code generations, okay? So you can use Gen AI models for image generations, which is used in marketing industries, advertising sec uh, sectors, the images which is generated to Gen AI can be used in the applications like uh, for background image generation, logo creation, okay, or dummy image generation, I mean test data or test image generations. All you can do with generative AI. You can even do speech synthesis and a speech translation using the Gen, Gen AI models. And if you see, we can create movies like videos using the artificial intelligence. So you must have uh, uh, seen some movies where we can see some characters which are not real or it can be generated with the artificial intelligence. So in one of the uh, South Indian movie, which is released uh, recently, has a character. So that's the second part of a movie. But in the first part, the actor who acted a particular role who has uh, died, but the same character is recreated in the second part using artificial intelligence. So that means even if the person is not existing, we can use his uh, face uh, in the movies for characters. Right? So using artificial intelligence, we can recreate that people on the screen. And we can use Gen AI models in uh, 3D designing. Okay, we can describe and the model is capable to design such 3D models. It may be a cartoon characters or the architectural, uh, uh, means the buildings, 3D structures, everything can be created using this generative AI. And we, we have different uh, uh, pre-existing applications, means we don't need to go and create such applications. There are already applications available in internet, you can see lots of applications available that can be used for image generation, audio generation, video generation, and 3D character design. So all this. So artificial intelligence, we are using widely across different domains, different industries for various purposes. So within one industry itself, we use it in the different departments. So marketing department is using artificial intelligence for designing the logos, marketing text, and everything. Okay, so the IT department will be using it for the code generation, deployment, auto automation script generations. Testing department will be using the artificial intelligence, when Gen AI for creating the test data synthetic data we can create. So within one industry or within one organization itself, we use Gen AI in different departments. So you can see the different Gen AI tools. So we have uh, the tools like uh, ChatGPT, which provides simple uh, chat interface to users and i think most of you must be familiar with that similarly we have different different tools and uh, services that uh, contribute 
to the generative AI ecosystem. So even GitHub Copilot is one of the uh, commonly used AI tool uh, provided by Microsoft and GitHub that is uh, used by the developers for the code generation. So if you are a developer, you don't need to go and write the code using the natural language. You can just tell the AI model to write the code. You can simply go and say, okay, can you write a Python application used to uh, uh, handle the books information? So it will create a Python application. You can describe what type of database to be used. Okay, how to uh, define the function. All you can specify using the uh, commands or instructions and the copilot is capable to generate that code for you. So like this, we have different uh, models and uh, tools available in the Gen AI ecosystem. And as I have mentioned, all these generative AI models are designed using some deep learning architectures. There are different deep learning architectures that works in different way, but they all generate some new content. Some of the generative AI methods or architectures are generative adversarial network, that is GAN, variational autoencoders, VAE, transformers, diffusion models, CNN, that is convolutional neural network, RNN, that is recurrent neural networks. So like this, there are different uh, uh, architectures available. That is, they are actually deep learning neural network architectures that can be used to build the generative AI models. If you see uh, the generative adversarial network, which is one of the uh, popular deep learning neural network that is used to build the generative AI models. So it primarily contains two members or two neural network that is a generator and a discriminator. In this, the generator is responsible to create new data instances. Suppose if my model is trained with millions of images, if my model is trained with the millions of images, and whenever the user provides a prompt for generating a new image, The generator is responsible to create a new image based on the uh, knowledge, means the trained data. It will try to create a new image. And the discriminator network is responsible to identify whether this is a fresh new image or it's just a copy of the trained data. Means whether it is a fake or real. Real means what are the data we have used to train the model. So it just took the image from the trained data set or it has created a fake image, means a new image. So discriminator is uh, identifying whether this uh, image which is generated or whether the data which is generated is actually a artificial data which is generated or it's just took the data from the training data set. During the training, the generator tries to produce the data that can hold the discriminator while the discriminator tries to distinguish between the generator data and the training data. So it will try to identify whether the data is generated is in real data 
or it's a fake data. So we use GAN in various uh, applications in various domains like for generating photographs of human faces. Suppose if I want to artificially generate some human faces, we can use GAN. So important thing is it should not be a real person's face, right? So for during the training, it will uh, use millions and millions of human faces. But when I ask the model to generate a, a human face, it should be a new human face, not, should not be the trained data model. Generate realistic photographs. So if I ask the model to create some background scenes or sceneries, you can uh, use the GAN to generate that. It should, it looks realistic but it should not be a trained data. We can use it for generating the cartoon characters. We can use it to uh, create image to image translation, means we will be providing an image and we can tell the model, okay, to create a similar image with a, a different uh, set of, or say different angle, different, uh, set of objects inside it. So image should be similar. For example, the kids are playing. So I'm providing an image of kids playing and I can tell the model create a similar image. So it will create a, another image of kids playing, which will be maybe in a different uh, angle, different address, different uh, age groups. Okay. So that means from one image, it a identifies what to generate and create a new image. Text to image translation. So we can provide a text command or text instruction and it will generate the image. We can use it for face aging. So you, there are a lot of uh, mobile applications available that shows if you are, if you were, uh, uh, young what were, what is your uh, face if you get if you get old what will be your face so that kind of applications we can see in uh, in in the mobile applications a play store or the app stores you can see so that you can do with the gan So another uh, deep learning neural network architecture is variational autoencoder, that is VAE. This is also used for generative AI models. So they are a type of generative model that capture the probability distribution of a data set and generates new samples. The encoder network maps the input data into a latent space, while the decoder network maps that latent variables back into the original data piece. So we will be providing one uh, data and that will be encoded into some uh, different data set which means it is placed into a latent space. And then the decoder's duty is to identify the parameters and then create a new data set out of it. The variational autoencoder can learn the underlying structure of the data distribution and generate a new new data samples from it. So we will be providing a set of data. Understanding these patterns, it will be able to create a similar type of data, but it will be completely different from the input data. That means so when we provide one input data, 
it will try to understand what is it and its a uh, structure and then recreate a similar one which is exactly different from that existing one the input data that is the duty of variational auto encoders and we use vae for generating realistic images of faces like vaes can learn the features of many faces and then create a new different looking faces but that still looks like a real face you must have seen a lot of uh, uh, ai applications that can generate the human faces but what it or how it is doing we we, we have trained or we have provided different uh, human faces as input and it will identify the different features of human faces like uh, neck positions eyebrow positions lips cheeks necks hair styles everything it will identify and then it will create a new face by using these parameters composing music by analyzing the songs vaes can generate new pieces of similar styles and instruments but with a unique melodies and rhythms so we can provide some audio inputs and identifying that instruments and voice used inside the uh, the the input data it can create a new audio with a similar instruments so i think I, i'm not sure whether you have uh, heard about the news that the oscar winner uh, ar rahman has recently composed a song and uh, the singers who sung the song in that uh, movie they have already died a couple of years back i think some years back but he has recreated their voice but how he did this he used their old songs as a sample data so the ai model understand or learns their voice pattern their tone their uh, way of singing and then he has used the same voice in his new song that means it uh, recreates the same voice but it is a completely new song it is recently released a movie song but it is uh, sung by the singers who died some years back that means he has recreated the same voice okay so that is uh, you can say it it's a kind of uh, application that is using the concept of vae text summarization is another feature that vaes can understand the main points of the lengthy document and create a shorter concise summary by keeping the key information and the next architecture is transformer model this is one of the most commonly used architecture even the widely accepted model like a gpt open ai gpt is also following the transformer model so transformer model is one of the most commonly used model which is primarily used to uh, generate the natural language output like uh, you can create stories essays poems and even question and answer translating the text from one language to another language and even chat based applications this model used in the uh, phone doesn't carry the overall context of the message 
it is simply predicts which word is more likely to come up after the last few. So what this model's benefit is, it use the context information to predict the next word. For example, if we use in our, uh, uh, if you use uh, the keyboard in our mobile, or if you type uh, in the applications like a, a mail application, like Outlook applications, when you use mobile phones, when you type one word, it will automatically predict the word, right? So you must have seen it when you reply for some mails, it will identify what is the mail content from the title, from the subject, and then automatically suggest some text, right? Or in the keyboards, you can see now the, now the keyboards, when you type some words, it automatically predict the next. It automatically predicts the next word. So that is uh, an implementation of the transformer model. Okay, because it is primarily used to predict the next sequence of characters or text by analyzing the current context. That's why I said it is primarily used in the natural language generations uh, scenarios. Transformers can keep track of the context of what is being written. And this is why the text that they generate makes sense. So that means when we type something, it will use the already typed text as a input or it will be part of the input request so that it will able to predict the next word or next sentence which uh, uh, will be making sense because it's not randomly predicting some word. So it depends on what you have typed, it will generate the meaningful uh, statement or meaningful word after that. Transformers are incredibly good at keeping track of the context and the next word they pick is exactly what it needs to keep going with an idea. For example, here if you write something like, uh, when you say write a story, okay, that is your uh, command. And when you uh, give this command like once a story, it will start writing the uh, story. That means it will be first adding the word once. Then it use the command and the already generated uh, input, sorry, already generated output as the input for the next word generation. So it will go write a story. Once will go as the next command and then predict and give the next word that is upon then it will use the previous command and the output to generate the next result. Like a once upon will go as the uh, command and uh, response will be a, the next word, so A. And after that it goes once upon A as the input and then the time will be returned. So that means by using the previously typed words, it will predict what need to be there in the next place. So you can, that's why it is uh, predicting this uh, complete sentence, okay, uh, which uh, gives a meaningful uh, result. So the main components of transformer model is one is tokenization embedding, positional encoding, transformer block, and the soft max layer. If you see what is the architecture of the transformer model is this one, 
that means whenever the user provides an input like a write a story it will be first tokenized then converted into embeddings that is numerics and then do the positional encoding and then it will go through various transformer blocks and each block will have a multi-head attention mechanism and a feed forward mechanism so once the transformer blocks generate the result there is a soft match layer which is uh, producing the output so to understand this uh, components see first understand what is token and what is tokenization process so token can be a single word okay so that means if i say hello how are you so in this hello how are you we can convert into four different tokens so hello will be one token how will be next token r will be next token and you will be the next token okay so token simply means a single word you can say or maybe a part of the word if it is the word is very lengthy word then it will divide the single word into two or three pieces and that piece will be the token okay but if it is a word with a three to four or four to five character it the full word will be the token okay so tokenization process mean whenever we provide some text it will be converting that into a series of tokens means as simply pieces a token can be a single word or sub word or a character or it depends on what kind of tokenization strategy it uses so mostly each word will be considered as a token so here below you can see when i provide a writer story it will be using write is a one token a will be another token story will be another token and dot will be another token and then it does embedding embedding is actually the numeric representation of your text okay because all these deep learning models they do not handle the data text data directly they instead of users the embeddings data that is the numeric representation of the data which places the text in a multi dimensional vector okay so the vector can be this this is just a two dimensional graph okay this is just a representation of a vector with the uh, two dimensions right x and y dimension but in case of uh, deep learning model embeddings it will be multi dimensional embedding okay so the number of dimensions can be more than 1000 okay so when we identify the tokens and these tokens will be placed in this multi dimensional uh, vector so that contains the uh, position of your word in a particular uh, vector or particular uh, latent space so if you see when we place a text or when we provide a text the words that has similar meanings can go into a same place or a similar location so we can see the in this uh, some of the fruits will go into a similar position the buildings goes into similar position balls will go into uh, similar position that means it's a ball but it's different type of balls you can see that means the words can be different but their meaning can be same so that may go into a similar position so that means whatever text you provide it will be converted into numerical values by identifying the position of that word okay suppose if one word has a close relation with another word it will be placed near to that particular word so that means it is identifying the position with in inside a multi dimensional vector and that coordinates positions will be returned as a vector data so that is a embedding so embedding you can simply understand it is a numerical representation of the text
So this is how it uh, identifies the uh, numbers, that is numeric representations. Each word will have its own numeric representation and that will be the embeddings vector contains. The positional encoding means within the given text, it identifies the sequence of words and then assign a position number for the text. For example, in this, write is the first word, then A is the second word, story is the third word, and dot will be in the fourth position. So it is assigning the position for each word in the input or output uh, text. The transformer block. For that, you first need to understand the attention process, self-attention. So attention helps give the context to each word based on the other word in the sentence. So it depends on the previous word. It will identify the position of this word or uh, it will give a weight for the given word. And the feed forward neural network, its uh, goal is to predict the next word formed by several blocks of smaller neural networks. That means by using the sequence of words, it is responsible to predict the next word. So attention is to uh, uh, specify the weight of each word and identify the position. And then feed forward is responsible to predict the next word based on this uh, positions of the word and the sequence of the words. And the softmax layer is responsible to generate the output text by placing that uh, text into appropriate position. So the output will be generated by the softmax layer. Okay, because the transformer outputs score for all words where the highest scores are given to the words that are most likely to be in the next sentence. That means it will be providing a sequence of uh, numbers or series of numbers to the words in particular order. And it, the softmax layer is responsible to understand this uh, weight and position and generate the, means order that words and then generates the response output. So transformer model is one of the most commonly used uh, deep learning neural network model that is widely used in various uh, Gen AI models. So the transformer architecture has proven highly effective for a wide range of sequence-based tasks, including machine translation, text summarization, and language modeling. So if you see, compared to some other uh, deep learning neural networks that follows the similar architecture, like uh, uh, recurrent neural networks, the, the difference is recurrent neural networks will not be able to remember the lengthy uh, text relationships. For example, if you are providing a short sentence, it will be able to remember and generate the output accordingly. But if you are providing a very lengthy description, it will be difficult for the RNN model to remember the relationship between the first two sentence and the last sentence. Suppose if there are uh, 10 sentences in the instruction, in the input command, so it will be difficult for the RNN network to identify the relationship between the first sentence and the 10th sentence. But in transformer model, even if the input text is very lengthy, it can easily relate or it can easily identify the relationship between these two words. So that's the reason when you provide a uh, input command, like a uh, write a story, that's the first 
command. Then I'm writing the next sentence as the story should tell about the relationship between a farmer and a king. That's the second uh, text or second string sentence. Then third, I'm saying the story should give uh, importance to the kindness and uh, uh, friendliness uh, behavior of human being. So that's the third sentence. And fourth sentence can be something. So when it analyzes the sentences sequentially, when it reaches the last sentence, it should not forget the first sentence. Because in recurrent neural network kind of models, if you are giving a very lengthy text, when it process and reach the last sentence, it may forget about the first sentence. Okay, so simply I'm saying it will be difficult for that model to remember the complete context. But in transformer, transformer model, it is uh, capable to remember even if the conversation or if even if the text is very lengthy. Okay. So that's why for most of the natural language processing, like uh, text summarization, story writing, dialogue writing, we can use the transformer models. So we have just discussed the transformer model. And what is the application of transformer model also we have discussed because it is mainly used for natural language processing, like a text summarization, story writing, content writing, okay, or question and answer generation, etc. And we can see open AI, which is one of the largest. AI model developers, they have a model called GPT, that is Generative Pre-trained Transformer, which follows that or which uses the transformer architecture to handle the user request and generate the response. So in the next section, we are going to discuss about the GPT models because GPT models follows or uses the transformer architecture. Now, let's understand about the GPT models. So before start understanding about GPT model, we have to first understand what is open AI. So open AI is an American artificial intelligence research laboratory. So Elon Musk was one of the co-founder of this, but later he has resigned and he has uh, started his own AI research laboratory and they are creating some new uh, AI models, but open AI is focusing creating generative AI models that can be used by the end users or simply the humans who don't have much technical knowledge also. That means people needs to use the, uh, the, the benefits or uh, power of generative AI that's why they build the generative AI models. So they are conducting research with the declared intention of promoting and developing a friendly AI. So open AI is giving focus to build AI models that can be used by uh, the end users. Its mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits of all humanity. So what is this artificial general intelligence? Artificial intelligence can be categorized into 
two, three categories or like a artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and artificial super intelligence. So the artificial narrow intelligence is usually used in some devices like, uh, so we can see there are artificial intelligence devices that can clean the room or artificial intelligence device that is something like Alexa, which can be used only for a specific purpose, right? So they can play some music or they can read the news or they can clean the room. So that kind of specific task we use the artificial narrow intelligence. But artificial general intelligence is used widely and these general intelligence models can be used for variety of tasks, not only in a particular domain, particular industry, particular task. It can be used in various domains for various purposes. And artificial super intelligence is the third category, which is yet to develop. Okay, it's already developed, but yes to yet to come into public because these are the models that can take the decisions on its own. Okay, like a super robotic devices which will think itself. I think it's already been introduced. You must have uh, heard a news that recently has come that a robot suicide because of the overwork. Okay, so recently a news has come, a robot has uh, committed suicide because the because of the overwork given by the owner. So that means the robot itself is start thinking itself. Okay, that means it is getting emotions. Okay, so such super intelligence uh, can be added to devices and applications, but it's not that popular now. Maybe in future it may come, but currently we are using artificial narrow intelligence and artificial general intelligence. And this organization is mainly focusing on artificial general intelligence, okay, which means the models that they develop can be used in various industries for various purposes. Open AI Incorporated is working on non-profit services. So if you see, they have a profit subsidiary also, that is Open AI Limited Partnership, Open AI LP, which is a profit subsidiary of this organization but it, they have an open ai incorporated which is for non profit services which uh, build ai models for various domains various industries and you can even use them for free at some level the open ai models capabilities if you analyze these open ais APIs can be applied to virtually any task that requires understanding or generating natural language or code. So you can use this open AI models in almost every domain, whether it is marketing, manufacturing, IT, or uh, healthcare, anywhere you can use this uh, artificial intelligence models and you can interact with this models in natural language and it can generate the responses in natural language or program code the open ai models can also be used to generate or edit the images for example there is a model called the dal e which you can use to generate the images. And you must have noticed that the Microsoft Copilot is using this DAL-E model for generating the images. 
So if you go to the Microsoft Copilot, you can see there is a, a designer that allow you to draw some images. For example, I can say draw an image of kids playing in ground. So I can just uh, give that instruction. Here you can see it says powered by DAL E3. You can see it's created four images, four variations of images. Okay, this is uh, creating a uh, cartoon type of image, but you can specify the style of the image. For example, Picasso style, vivid style, or uh, a realistic image. Okay, cartoon type image, 3D style image. So what type of image you want, you can specify that. So this is actually uh, used, or it's actually uh, generated using the OpenAI's DAL E model. So the Copilot is actually not a model. Copilot is actually a product or service provided by uh, Microsoft. Okay, and it is integrated in different softwares. Copilot for uh, Microsoft 365, Copilot for Dynamic 365, Copilot for Bing, Copilot for Windows, right? And this Copilot behind the scene using GPT models as well as DAL E models. Open AI models can convert speech to text. That is, you have the uh, speech to text model that is whisper, or you can use the TTS that is text to speech model. Okay, from the open AI. Open AI models can moderate the content to detect harmful and sensitive information. Suppose if your uh, content, the request contains some harmful content or sensitive data, like uh, some personally identifiable information, like PII, like uh, passwords, credit card numbers, mobile phones, email. Okay, so it can. Uh, mask or block such sensitive data when you handle or when you use the open AI models. You can see the different uh, types of generative AI models provided by uh, open AI. If you see, GPT-4 is one of the latest GPT model. You must have uh, heard that they have released GPT-4's Omni version, that is GPT-4O and GPT-4O Mini recently. And GPT-4 is actually a multi-model model. Multi-model model means it is capable to accept text as well as image as an input and generate the text output. For example, I can upload the image and ask the model to explain the image. So what is there inside the image? So you can ask the model to explain it. So that means it is accepting not only the text, but also image as an input. But GPT 3.5 is another family of models which accept only text data, which is similar to GPT 4, but you can say it's a previous version of GPT model, okay. but it is only handling the text data, which, which cannot access or accept image as an input. And also, 
the context size used by the GPT 3.5 is less. So what is context size will explain later. And it is uh, comparatively an old type of model because it's a uh, these models are all pre-trained models, right? So these all deep learning models are pre-trained models. These GPT 3.5 model is trained with some old data set, maybe a year or two, uh, a, a one year or two year old data is used to train this, train the, train this model. But GPT 4 is uh, trained with uh, much later, latest data, not very recent, but yes, Compared to GPT 3.5, it is trained with much later data. Embeddings is another model. So I have already explained about the embedding that when you want to handle your data with the generative AI models, it has to be converted into numeric formats, that is vector formats. For these vector formats, we use the embeddings model, which can convert the text data into numeric format. For example, I can show you a very sample database that store the vector format data. So here I have a MongoDB database. You can see here the text description is various grocery items. Okay, and there is an amount is 309, expense date, and there are some other informations. So this text entry is converted into vector format. So for that, if you look into this, here, that text is converted into a simple sentence. Here you can see an amount of rupees 309 is paid by this person to this person for various uh, grocery items as expense on this date. So this is the string and this string is converted into a content vector. You can see this is the vector representation of that data. So this is, you see, this is what the vector representation of that string. So you can see this. This is what it is. Okay. So this text is converted into it's a corresponding numeric format by using the embeddings model. And converting into the embeddings format is very, very important when you customize your models with your own data. For example, uh, whenever you use the models like a GPT models, we are actually using the pre-trained model, which means the OpenAI already trained these models with some data, but it cannot answer or it cannot process or it cannot generate the responses based on our personal data. For example, if I have a company and I have some personal uh, informations within my database and I want my model to generate the results based on that data. But unfortunately, thus models are not able to uh, generate the res results or generate the responses based on your personal information because 
your personal information is not part of the trained data. But it is possible that you can provide your personal data as a knowledge base or as a grounding content to the models and the models will be able to generate the results based on your personal data. But for that, you cannot simply provide your data as a text content. You have to convert them into numeric format and then provide it to the model. Then the model understand information from the given content and then it generates the responses based on that. For converting your text into numeric formats, you need the embeddings model. DAL-E. So DAL-E is another model which I have shown in uh, the, the co-pilot. It uh, uses DAL-E to generate the images. So DAL-E is an image generation model which can accept uh, string commands or string instructions. And based on that, it will generate the images. Whisper is another model provided by OpenAI, but that is for the speech recognition for converting the audio into text. And it is also possible to translate that speech into multiple languages. So our focus is on GPT model, that is generative pre-trained transformer, because it uses the transformer architecture. It is mainly used to generate the natural language text. So GPT is a family of AI models that can generate human-like text which means I can tell the model to create some story or poem or dialogues or question and answers, a lot of things. The model is capable to generate the responses based on its knowledge. I said these models are trained with some data which was which is available in the internet. But if the data which which is trained is old and you are asking about some new information, the model may not be able to answer for that. GPT uses the transformer architecture, which is a neural network that can process sequential data such as text and speech using the attention mechanisms. GPT is pre-trained on large and diverse data set of text and images which gives uh, it a knowledge of the world and language. So I said GPT-4 can handle text as well as image. So the new GPT models are trained with uh, images as well as text. GPT is generative, which means it can produce new and original content, such as stories, poems, code, memes based on the given prompt. So if you want, you can simply go and try in chat GPT or in the co-pilot. Suppose if you want, you can do that in the co-pilot. So you can ask the model to do something. Create a story of a farmer and a cruel king. So I just given a simple prompt and you can see it start creating a story, right? So that means the model is capable to generate the natural language output. It's still generating the lengthy story. If you look at the evolution of GPT models, 
GPT initial version is released in 2018, which was the first version. And after that, they have released GPT-2 in 2019, which is having some advanced features and parameters. And GPT-3, which was one of the uh, largest and powerful uh, transformer model, uh, model that is uh, widely used at that time. And later, they have released a GPT 3.5, which is still used by many organizations, okay, because it is very, very fast and uh, intelligent. But later, they have released a GPT 4, which is a large multimodal model that can accept images and text. So now, for modern applications, means the new applications, people prefer to use GPT-4, but understand GPT-4 was very, very costly compared to 3.5. Okay, so uh, if you are looking for a cost-effective model, then go, go for the 3.5 and GPT-4 Turbo, which is the version GPT-4 Turbo is very costly model. But the benefit is it is one of the largest uh, data model, which has a huge number of parameters and a large context size. So it has a context size of 128K. Context size means what is the amount of data it can process at a time. That is 128K, which means 128,000 tokens it can handle in one request okay but if you look at the 3.5 model the maximum context size is 8k or 16k okay so 16k model is available 8k model is also available means 8000 tokens or 16000 tokens but if you see gpt4 which is 128k which has a larger context size but because it is very, very costly compared to 3.5, people uh, are not interested to use it. So they have released, recently they have released some cost effective versions of GPT-4, that is GPT-4O, that is Omni, and GPT-4O Mini. Okay. So I'll show you the uh, comparison between them later. And since these models are pre-trained models, whenever you ask a question about your personal information or your organization specific information, it cannot answer because all these models are called the pre-trained models. But the question, if the model cannot answer anything about my organization data, then what is the benefit of using it? So as a solution, they have introduced a concept called a fine tuning. So fine tuning we will discuss more in detail in the coming slides. So fine tuning is an approach for customizing your model with your own organization specific data. So there are some fine tuning models available which allow you to customize the models the key concepts of uh, gpt models are first one is api key that means if you have to make a request to the AI model, you need to authenticate because whenever you make a request to generative AI models, not only the open AI, but any model, this will be going into the uh, generative AI server and then execute it. But how the server will understand that the request is coming from an authenticated user? For that, it uses API key as a authentication mechanism. Then the second is prompt. 
A prompt is very, very important in generative AI models because the user is going to interact with the model using this prompt. Prompt is the text that the user provide as a command or instruction to the model. So how clear and specific is the prompt? Your response will be that accurate and the relevant. The completion endpoint. Every Gen AI service is exposed as a REST API, means they are published over internet as a REST API. So whenever you want to consume these models, you will be making an HTTP request to these models. So this HTTP request will be sent to an HTTP URL. That URL is called the completion endpoint. For different types of functionalities, different endpoints will be used. So the types of endpoints we'll see in the next slide. Token is an important concept. We have already discussed in the transformer model architecture that when you provide a text, it is divided into tokens. A token simply represents a single word or maybe a piece of the word. So how many tokens you are using in your request and response based on that the cost is calculated because the model's cost is calculated or the request cost is calculated based on how many input tokens you have used and how many output tokens you have used. And the same token concept is also used to decide the model's capability. That is how much the data the model can handle at a time. So in the previous list of models, GPT models, I said GPT 3.5 model can handle maximum 8,000 tokens or 16,000 tokens at a time. But in GPT 4 model, 128,000 tokens it can handle at a time. That means the GPT-4 model can handle large uh, context of data or large set of data. The temperature is the next parameter. Temperature is a configuration parameter for the API request because it is a numerical value that we configure between 0 and 1, where 0 means the model always produce a predictive, predictable results or uh, static kind of result. But the number or the temperature value, which is 1 or near to 1, like a 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.7, or 1. So these are near to 1. So they provide some more creative answers. So whenever you make a request, the answers will be more creative. So to make the model answers more creative, you can use the temperature value near to one. But if you want to stick to a static answer type, then you have to set the temperature parameter as zero or near to zero, like a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, like that. And finally, you have to choose a model, okay? Because there are many models available. As a developer or as a end user, you have to choose an appropriate model which satisfies your requirement. So because I have to use an AI application, you cannot simply go and choose a model. You have to clearly understand what is your requirement and what are the capabilities of each model. Accordingly, you will select a particular model. For example, if you 
need to handle a very large set of data then if you go for gpt 3.5 it may not be able to hold the entire data because we know the context size is very small but if you use gpt 4 then the context size is very big that means 128000 tokens it can store so it can store a very large amount of text at a time so we can choose that but the problem is gpt4 turbo models are slower than gpt3.5 models so if you use gpt4 response will get delayed it will be a little slow but gpt3.5 will be much faster so if you are giving more focus on speed rather than the context size then you can go for the gpt 3.5 so that's why i said you have to be aware the capabilities of each model then select the appropriate model based on your requirement there are some old models and new models available and you can also see what are the different uh, process or things you can do with this gpt models we can classify the content like uh, you must have seen in uh, uh, applications like uh, book my show or flipkart in all these we are we are uh, uh, analyzing the sentiment of the text okay so it is uh, uh, using the artificial intelligence models to analyze the sentiment of the user feedback for example if the customer is giving a positive feedback or negative feedback about a product or movie that can affect the rating of the movie. So the rating of movie or rating of the product is calculated based on the comments or the reviews given by the user. But from the given comment, from the given text, how we will identify the rating? Because first we have to identify whether it is a positive comment or a negative comment, right? So that we can do with the help of gen ai models if it is a positive comment then we will increase the rating if it is a negative comment we will decrease the rating another use case is generating the new contents for example if you are a content creator you can tell the gen ai models to create certain contents maybe stories articles blogs you can uh, create with the help of artificial intelligence transformation or translation suppose inside your app application you want to translate your text from one language to another language you can ask the gen ai model to do that for example in a chat application Suppose if your application is using a chat, you can tell the model to handle different languages. For example, if the user is asking a question in a particular language, the model is capable to understand that and uh, execute this uh, and then generate the response in the same or different language okay so user can interact with the generative ai models using different languages for example so let me check whether it is working i have an application so here we can provide some text okay i'll just uh, put some
So that is a custom application created. Maybe I can create a text here in Hindi. Maybe show me the latest expenses. So I'm just uh, taking this. I'm just providing this as an input here. Let's see whether this is processing or not. See here, it is showing the uh, result, which is coming from the database. So if you see the data, which is stored here, it's actually go and make a request from this custom data. So there are, I think there is, okay. So you can see the here, an amount of rupees 230 paid by Sonu to various vendors. Okay, so like this. So this is the text. Okay, and uh, this is shown here as the response. You can see by Sonu for various vendors, but you can see it is the actual data is stored in the English. But I have asked the question in Hindi because it is searching inside the database, finding the matching result, which is in English, and then generating the response back in English. But the same question if I'm asking in English, so suppose this I'm asking, in English. See, the same result is coming, but you can see it is in English. So the generative AI application, which is used inside this chat application, is capable to understand the language of the user input and then process that in the back end. So if required for searching inside the database, it will convert that into English and then doing the uh, search inside the database, finding the matching result and then convert it back to Hindi because my input string was in uh, Hindi. So the output also it generates in the same format. But inside the database, the result or sorry, the data is stored in which language? Uh, English language, but it, yes, the Gen AI model is capable to translate uh, that into different language, do the search, process it, and then convert back to uh, the source language, right? So that is the capability of Gen AI models. Summarization. So summarization means if you have a very, very lengthy text, which may have a four to five paragraphs of uh, data, and I want to summarize the key points into a single paragraph, we can tell the model, okay, I have this very lengthy uh, text, which you have to summarize into a single paragraph within 10 sentences like that. So it will summarize that lengthy text into a simple paragraph. Continuation. So you can ask the model to uh, complete the statement. So you, mean, you can say once upon a time there was a king and the remaining story it will automatically fill. So you have to just give the starting point and the remaining thing it will complete. Similarly, in functions, when you build the, uh, suppose if you are using uh, the, the uh, applications, if you are a developer, when you write the code, for example, let's consider this one. 
So here I'm using an AI assistant. So this is a very simple JavaScript file I will use. Suppose if I'm creating a function, uh, maybe sum, and then when I when I provide the beginning section like a function sum, the remaining code it is suggesting. Can you see? It's suggesting I just need to auto complete this. Similarly, if I'm writing function binary sort. Okay, see, it is actually completing the code. So I'm giving only the beginning part. The continuation is automatically filled by the AI model, right? So that is what called a continuation or completion. Question answering. So you can ask any questions to your Gen AI model, like uh, what is the name of the moon or which is the largest planet or who is the president of America? So that kind of simple questions you can ask, the model will be able to reply. And you can even use it this in the chat. So you can simply converse with your uh, AI models. Okay, so in the chat based applications, you can use it. Okay, so what we do, we'll take a small break now. So, so far we have discussed what is generative AI, its uh, capabilities, and the different uh, deep learning architectures like a GAN, VAE, and very importantly, the transformer. And after that, we have understood what is GPT model, that is the open AI models, and specifically the importance of GPT model, and what are the things it can do, and also the different components of uh, uh, GPT, because the, like a uh, prompt, temperature, API key model and the endpoint. And we have seen finally what are the things the model can do. And going forward, we will understand some advanced features of this model. And but before that, let us take a small break for 15 minutes. And after that, we will continue. Okay, so let's go for a small break. We'll take a 15 minutes break now and 12.30, uh, we will continue.
हेलो यस लेट्स कंटिन्यू द सेशन सो वी हैव डिस्कस्ड द फीचर्स ऑफ GPT models so far. Now let's move to the next. So generative AI and prompt. So let's understand what is prompt. So we have already discussed about the prompt that it is the text input that we are providing to the model. Okay. So that means when the user wants to generate some kind of uh, data, it may be image or it may be text, we can provide a text instruction to the model. That instruction is called prompt. And the completion means the response which is generated by the model. So if you are interacting with the GPT model specifically, there are primarily three endpoints we use that is completion, embeddings, and chat completion. So, completion and the embeddings, these are the two models or two endpoints we were using in the older versions of GPT models, like a GPT 3. We were using the completion and embedding. So completion means you have to just provide an input text as a parameter or as an input and it will generate the response text. Embeddings means you provide a text as an input and the model returns an array of numbers that is the uh, numeric representation of the uh, text. But the latest GPT models like a GPT 3.5 or the GPT 4 kind of latest models, they are supporting the chat completion model or chat completion uh, kind of end prompt in which the user need to converse with the uh, model using a chat conversation style means we will be sending a chat request to the model and uh, the AI assistant is responding a chat response. So there is a chat message structure will be used for the interacting with the uh, GPT models. So this chat completion uh, is used in GPT 3.5 or the latest versions of models. If you use uh, or if you are using this generative AI models like a GPT, the model is capable to generate the responses, but how efficient or relevant or accurate the response is, it depends on the prompt. Right. For example, if I have to generate a simple function code, means maybe a Python function, JavaScript function, or C# -sharp function using artificial intelligence. If I tell the model write a function, it will simply create a function, but that function may not be relevant and accurate. To make that function or make, to make that output more relevant and accurate, you have to clearly specify the requirements. Like uh, I want to create a function with this name that accepts these number of parameters and it will do this operation and returns this output. So this kind of complete instruction you have to provide. It means if you provide a detailed instruction, it will be able to give you the accurate and relevant response. So prompt engineering is a technique for enabling 
uh, the model to create accurate and relevant responses. So if you simply provide an prompt, it may not uh, be understood by the model correctly and it may not produce the accurate results. So to generate the results effectively, you can use the prompt engineering so that maximize the relevancy and accuracy of the completions. You can specify the formatting and style of completions. You can provide conversational context in the prompt and it will avoid or it will mitigate the bias and improve the fairness. Okay. So that means if you want your output need to be in a particular style or the uh, context, the conversation context need to be provided, then you can use the prompt engineering techniques. So there are different uh, prompt engineering techniques we can use. And some of the pro prompt engineering techniques are, one is clear and specific instructions. So when user provide a prompt, how much elaborate prompt you can give that much better to get the accurate result. For example, as I mentioned, just create a function for sorting an array. So this is just a normal prompt, but you can say create a function with the name sort array that accept a number, oh, sorry, an array of numbers as an argument and use the binary sorting method to sort the array. At the end, the function returns the sorted array as a response. So if you give such kind of detailed description in the prompt, the model can create the appropriate function. Otherwise also it will create the function, but it may not be the expected one. So you have to provide clear and specific instructions in the prompt. Second thing is using the system messages. So system message means when you use the chat completions, like a, I said in GPT 3.5 or later versions, it uses the chat completions. So in the chat completions, the first chat message you can configure as a system message. So what is the benefit of system messages? It will be used to define the behavior of your AI assistant. It will be used to define the behavior of your AI assistant. That means your AI assistant will be able to generate the results according to the user requirement. Because suppose I can tell the AI model that you are a programmer. So that whenever I ask a question, the AI assistant will behave like a programmer and give the answers in the program code. But I can say that uh, AI assistant, that you, you are a teacher. So that whenever I ask a question, the AI model will explain the answers like a teacher. Or you can tell the model that you are a movie artist. So whenever I, uh, or maybe a comedy artist, if you are saying, whenever I ask a question, it will be responding like a comedian, like adding some funny statements inside the response. So system message is typically used to set the behavior of the assistant and also can be used to set the context. Okay, so what we are doing or what uh, we are talking about that you can configure using the system message. So it will help the model to understand how to generate the responses. Third thing is conversation history and example. So inside your prompt, you can include some examples along with your actual command or actual instruction. So it will help the model to understand how the answers to be formatted. For example, I can say, okay, you 
are an assistant or you are an AI assistant that is analyzing the sentiment of the user feedback. If I'm just simply giving this and then giving a sentiment saying, okay, this is a good product. So the AI will respond that according to your uh, feedback, I can understand that this is a positive feedback. But I don't need a, such a lengthy description as a response. I need a, just a one word, whether it is positive or negative. So when I give the prompt, along with the prompt, I can give some examples. For example, I can say, uh, if the user is giving, this product is not good, then assistance response is negative. That's just one word. Another example I can add, okay, this product looks very awesome. Then the feedback or the response is positive. Okay, so like this two or three examples, if I'm including, then the model is understanding, okay, whenever the user gives a feedback, I'm supposed to answer just using a single word, like a positive or negative. Okay, so when the user gives the actual question, it will answer in such a way, like a, just a one word will be returned instead of lengthy description. Okay, so conversation history, you can use to add examples. So the examples will help the model to understand how to answer. Okay, so that is also a best practice or that, that is also a prompt engineering technique. And the next is chain of thought. Chain of thought is another approach of prompt engineering for resolving complex task. Suppose if I have a very complex task which requires multiple steps of calculations or mul multiple steps of processing to find out the final answer. In such case, we can tell the model, show the result, not as a single final answer, give me the step by step uh, process how you have concluded with the answer like how you started then step by step how it processed and how it came into the final result okay so such uh, description you can specify in your prompt so that is called a chain of thought so these are some of the prompt engineering techniques with, that will help the model to generate accurate and relevant responses. Now we will come to some advanced techniques. Okay. But before that, let me see whether I have uh, Open AI model available. So this is an Azure Open AI service. So now Open AI is available uh, in in the Azure cloud as a service. So this is my open AI service or open AI service instance available on Azure. And I have done a deployment. I will show you a simple uh, chat completion example. So here is my chat playground. And I already have deployed a model. So if you see, I have different uh, models deployed, like a GPT 3.5 version, that is 16K model. I have a GPT 4 model deployed. Okay, so like that, different uh, uh, OpenAI models I have deployed. I'm going to use one of this model in the chat playground. So here, this is the chat playground. And here you can choose one of the model. So I'm selecting GPT 3.5, or I can go with the GPT 4 model. Okay, I'm selecting 3.5, that's enough. And here is 
the option for configuring the system message. So here I can configure the system message that you are an ass assistant that answers the questions in a funny way like a comedian. Okay. So I am setting the behavior of the AI assistant and let me save that change. And here I can ask a question. How to uh, find the how to find the answers or maybe how to find the um, size of earth. Just I'm asking a question. So let's see. You can see the answer. Well, the easiest way to find the size of the earth is to ask a, re a really tall person to give it a good measure with a really long ruler. Just make sure that they don't trip and accidentally knock the planet off its axis. See, this answer is coming like a funny answer, right? Because I have said that you are a comedian. So answer in a funny way. But the same question I'm asking to a teacher. Look at that. I'm copying this and I'm changing. You are an assistant that answers the questions like a teacher. Okay. And then I will be setting the behavior. And let me clear the chat and then ask the same question. See, the teacher is explaining that in the step-by-step -step format, not like a funny way. You can see. Okay, choose the two points of the Earth's surface that are relatively far apart, such as two cities and landmarks. Measure the distance between them, so and so. Right. So it is how a teacher is answering the way it is answering. Right. So that means we can use the system message to set the behavior of the AI assistant. And also, I can give some examples here. So we can see you are an AI assistant that analyzes the sentiment of the user feedback. So I'm just giving only this. That means only the system message that says that you are analyzing the feedback of the user prompt. So I'm just giving, okay, this is a good product. Let's see how it answers. See, it is a giving a lengthy answer. It's a, this sentiment for the user feedback is positive. So let me give another one. This product is not worth money. I don't recommend it. See, this is again a lengthy statement, but I'm expecting the answer as a single word, negative or positive. So, what I can do, I can provide some examples here. Like a first example, if the user says, this is uh, awesome product. So the expected answer, because it's a positive one, I'm expecting the answer as a positive. Okay. Then add one more example saying, this not looks good. Okay, so I can say answer assistant answer is negative. Then one more example. I feel this one is nice. 
and again I'm giving positive only this and I will I have given three examples here right and then I'll save this and then I'll give the same feedback here that this product is not worth money and I don't recommend it so clear the chat and let's try see only that word is coming instead of the lengthy description, right? So what is the benefit of using example? So by looking into the examples, the model is able to understand how to answer. So this is a single word answer. So it is giving the answers in a single word. Maybe you, if you want to do rating based on this, you can give a numbers for positive, like a, for positive it is plus one and negative it is minus one. Okay. And then apply the changes and the same prompt I'm going to give again and see what will be the result. It says it's minus one because it's a negative one. So this is the way you control the behavior of your model, right? So like a system message for changing its uh, character or behavior and the examples will help you to get the results on a particular format, right? So these are some of the, the uh, uh, prompt engineering techniques that we can apply on GPT models. Now we will see some of the advanced techniques and applications. Like uh, if you see, uh, to understand about the latest GPT models, like a GPT-4, which is a multi-model model, which means it is uh, not only accepting the text as an input, but it is capable to accept image as uh, input. So comparing to the older GPT model, like a GPT-3.5, which accept only the uh, text input, GPT-4 models are capable to accept uh, even images. So what is the benefit is you can upload an image and ask the model, can you explain uh, this image or can you tell me what is there, what is this image? So the model is capable to tell you that, okay. So here we have different uh, GPT-4 models available in OpenAI. So the older model is GPT-4, GPT-4 Turbo. So the GPT-4 Turbo is very costly. If you see for input, it use it cost $10 for a million request. And for output, million request means million tokens. Okay, so not number of requests. For 1 million tokens, it is using $10 for input. And for output, it is $30 for 1 million tokens. Okay, but this is uh, one of the latest GPT-4 model th that has a vision capability inside it. And the context size, that means how many tokens it supports in requests and responses, 128K. And it has a training data up to December 2023. Because this is very costly, but it is a very powerful and intelligent. But the problem that we see is this is slow. It's powerful means in the sense it can generate very accurate results. Okay, compared to the older GPT 3.5. But the problem is a little slow and also it is very costly. So people not interested to use GPT-4 Turbo because it is very costly. That's why they have released, it's a minified version you can say, that is GPT-4O, where O stands for Omni, and it is uh, input, it will cost $5. You can see it is $10, and here it is $5 for 1 million tokens and for output it is 15 dollar per 1 million token and this is a high intelligent flagship model which is doing similar 
to GPT-4 Turbo, and it is much, much faster compared to the GPT-4. So that means people can now use the GPT-4 capabilities in lower cost and much faster model they will get. But again, for small scale applications, I don't want to spend this much and I want the AI capabilities, uh, but I don't want to spend much and I want a lightweight version of this model with the same capabilities. So they have introduced another model, which is a minified version of that GPT-4O, that is GPT-4O Mini, which is posting around $0.15 for 1 million tokens and for output $0.60 for 1 million tokens. And this is for intelligent small model for the fast lightweight task. Means if your organization's AI operations are very simple, like maybe like a chat operation, something like that, then it is better to use GPT-40 Mini. Okay, which is much, much cheaper than the previous versions of GPT-4. So these models are actually pre-trained models, right? That means all the open AI models that we are getting, they are actually pre-trained with the millions of data available in the internet. But the problem is, if I have an organization where I want to implement some AI application that interact with my uh, custom data or that can uh, interact with, you, with the users uh, who wants to know more about my organization. For example, if I'm running a finance organization or I'm having a hospital. And in my hospital, I have uh, different departments and multiple doctors in each department. And customer means patients can take appointments for a particular doctor on particular time. So usually what they do now is they call to the hospital reception and then they will be asking whether this doctor is available. Okay, and uh, if the doctor is available, they can book an appointment. Okay, but I want to reduce the task of the receptionist because they have different other tasks and they don't want to spend time on attending the patient's calls. So patients can now go and book the appointments or they can search the hospital's details using the website. Inside the website, there is an intelligent chatbot available. So the customer or the patients can ask, what are the different uh, treatment options available in the hospital? Then I'm expecting the chatbot should say, okay, these are the different uh, treatment options available in this hospital. Then I will ask for this particular uh, treatment or for this particular de department, which, which of the doctors are available. Then it should uh, give the complete list of doctors in that particular department. Then I can ask the next question. Okay, uh, is this doctor available in this particular time? Then it has to go and check the consulting time of that particular doctor and answer yes whether this doctor is available or not available okay so i want to use a chatbot to interact with the patient in a natural language way that means the user will be asking the questions just like a normal uh, speech like he can simply type or use the microphone to ask these questions and the model or the chatbot is using an AI model that gives the answers to the uh, customers. Okay. But unfortunately, if I'm using or if I'm planning to use generative AI models, the problem is 
these generative AI models are pre-trained with the data available in the internet, and these models don't know anything about this particular hospital, because this hospital may be uh, uh, located in a particular city in India. So the GPT model is not aware that there is a hospital, and in this hospital, these many departments available. In these departments, these are the doctors available, and these are the consulting time for these doctors. So the model is not aware about that. Then how the model will answer those questions? So we have to customize the models. Okay, for customizing or enhancing the capabilities of the model, so that the model is could be able to answer uh, the questions of customers that is specific to the organization or specific to the department, specific to the domain. But how will customize the model? For customizing these models, we have primarily two options. One is fine tuning, and the second is RAG, that is retrieval augmented generation. Fine tuning is one option for customizing this model with uh, some user specific data. So we can use fine tuning by providing the custom data and retrain the model. Okay. That means there are different approaches for fine tuning. You can provide examples. You can configure custom data, retrain the model. Okay, but the problem with the fine tuning is you have to retrain the model. Okay, that means you will take a base model, and then you provide your own custom data, and then you retrain the model. For retraining the model, you need a advanced uh, systems. And once, and, and this training will take time. Maybe it depends on what is the amount of data that you are providing. Depends on that. The training will take time. Okay. And once the training is completed, you have to publish the retrain the model. Because the, once the training is completed, you have to publish the train, train the model. So before that, you have to test it, right? So that means fine tuning means you will be customizing the model by uh, adding your own custom data, retraining this model. Once the retraining is completed, you have to publish this model. Okay, or you have to update the model. Maybe it depends on what kind of model you are using. Okay, so the problem with fine tuning is it's uh, take time and also this is like a one time process. Okay. Suppose if the data is continuously updating, suppose today I have a set of data, so we have fine tuned. Tomorrow, again, the data is updated with some more information. So tomorrow, again, we have to fine tune. That means every time we have to fine tune this model. And that is little time consuming process. So most of the time we don't prefer the fine tuning, but obviously fine tuned models are faster than uh, the other ways of customization. But fine tuning will take time and it uh, requires uh, training for this models. So uh, people will use fine tuning as a last option, but they have some other ways to provide custom data to the models. For that, you need to understand what is embedding. So we have already discussed what is embedding. Like uh, we have some unstructured data it may be image or text maybe a json data or a simple plain text data or csv data or it could be some image data 
we can use some deep learning models to convert this data into embedding vectors, that is numeric vectors. I have showed you in my MongoDB database, I have stored the vector data, right? The numeric representation of the text. So similar way, we have to convert all our data into a numeric vector and that vectorized data we have to store into vector databases. So vector database is a special type of database. Okay, just uh, uh, not like the, the relational or NoSQL databases. Vector databases will have the capability for storing the vector embeddings and it also provides the similarity search capability, which means when there is a search query comes, it is capable to find the relevant data from the vectorized format. Okay, so that vector search will be supported. That is the similarity search. So these vector databases will be capable for storing the uh, vectorized audio data, vectorized text data, and vectorized video data or image data. Okay. So there are different uh, vector databases supported or used in AI applications. For example, you can use MongoDB. That is one of the most common one. Or you can use the pine cone. For example, if you go to pine cone, this is a vector database. You can see pine cone serverless lets you deliver remarkable gen AI applications. Okay, so that means this is one vector database that you can use. Another one is Milvus. This is another one. You can use this also if you want inside your AI applications for storing the vectorized data. Or you can use MongoDB vector. So now you can see MongoDB is supporting the vector search. Okay, so you can build intelligent applications powered by semantic search and generative AI over any type of data using a full featured vector database. So MongoDB is now supporting the vector storage. And there are many other databases that support that you can use as a vector storage. So Vector databases will be storing the data in vector format and it will create the vector indexes for searching for the data. Now let's understand what is retrieval augmented generation. So this is uh, the second approach for customizing these models. So the first approach we have discussed is fine tuning, which we have to customize the model by providing the custom data, retrain the model, and then use it. But in retrieval augmented generation, which does not modify the existing uh, AI model, okay, that means it is not going to make changes on the AI model. Instead of that, it is just uh, use our custom data as a grounding content for generating the responses. So what is this grounding content? Based on which information the model is generating the responses, that data is called a grounding content. For example, I can give a paragraph about myself and then I can tell the model that, okay, I, uh, who is Mr. Sonu? 
or what are his uh, ex skills or expertise or what are the hobbies of sonu so you can ask the model about uh, sonu the model is capable to answer because i have given my complete information my complete history biodata to the model so model is looking into the data and then answering so it's just like a open book exam so when whenever we ask a question to the model model will go to the data or database and search for the matching answer and then give that answer to us okay so that is like a open book exam but in fine tuning we are telling the model to remember that information in the memory that means we are customizing this model and we, we are telling the model to remember the uh, informations in memory and whenever we ask a question it answers the questions from the memory but in rag approach there is no changes happening to the model instead we will tell the model to look into the database which is, contains the vectorized data find the matching results based on the question that is called a similarity search it does and then get the responses or generate the responses based on that okay so in rag approach we are not modifying the models instead we find the matching or we will uh, fetch the matching informations from the database that is vector databases provide this matching informations to the model and then tell the model can you generate the answers based on this information that approach is called a retrieval augmented generation you can store proprietary business data or information about the world and have your application fetch it for the llm at generation time reducing the likelihood of hallucinations so that means we uh create an application that fetch the informations from our proprietary data source and then pass it to the model and ask the model to generate the results the result is a noticeable boost in the performance and accuracy of your gen ai application so this will give you the accurate information about your proprietary data or about your organization so this is how the rag works for example if the user makes a request that is he is asking a question okay this question is usually answered by the ai model right so the question is directly coming to the ai model and the ai model will provide an answer this is what usually happens but when you use rag approach there is a slight variation in the traditional process what it does when we make a request or when we ask a question the question is first converted into a uh, vector format okay that is the embedding model is converting that into a vector format and inside the database it will do a vector search means it will be searching for the matching documents inside the vector database so inside the vector database we already have all the informations and when the user ask a question it will go and search for the matching informations and that matching informations will be returned as a context can you see relevant context from the company data will be returned that means the matching informations will be returned now the original question we already have plus the fetched informations that also combined that is the question and the context is then sent to the ai model and the ai model use 
this context information this context information means the matching documents so it uses this matching documents to answer this question so it generates the answers based on this context information and returns back to the user okay so this is very very easy and simple to configure uh, i can show this very simply in the azure portal so let me go to my azure portal and here i think i have the sample data So this is an HP user manual. Okay, so you can see this is the HP laptops user guide. And here you can see the informations about how to use the laptop, like allocating hardware, the left side, like uh, right side, and the specification and how to use the device it means how to manage the power how to switch on switch off how to hibernate how to set the password how to configure the bios all these informations are here or how to create the recovery media and backup so, so all these informations are here okay this is specific to hp laptop but look at that if i go to my ai model so here i'm just uh, Resetting this. Okay, so this is my chat playground, and here I have not configured any custom data here. I'm just asking the model like, uh, OK, let me use this PDF. So here I'm just asking how to create a recovery media and do the backups. So that's the question I'm going to ask. How to create recovery media and uh, uh, do the backup in HP laptops. See, currently I'm not using any custom data. So when I ask this question, definitely it will answer, but this answers will be coming from the pre-trained memory only. That means what it has already learned at the time of training so it will give that answer, but that answer may not be relevant to our model of HP laptop. This may be a common HP laptop configuration, but I'm using a special model or specific model of HP laptop. There the configuration can be different, but I'm asking this question. So what it answers, let's see. So it's saying uh, to create a media from uh, media and perform the backup on HP laptop, you follow these steps. So this is the general uh, information that you get. Okay, this is a general information. But what I'm expecting is this AI model needs to go and look into this PDF, look at this PDF and then provide the answers. Okay. So what I what I can do is, okay, so let me download this. So I have downloaded this into a local machine. Okay, so what I'm expecting is the model needs to answer the questions based on this uh, PDF. So here, this is a generic answer. Now what is what generated is a generic answer. You can see these are the, steps usually followed in hp laptops okay but what i'm going to do now is 
uh, let me create a storage account container. For example, I say RAG uh, docs. So I'm giving a container called RAG docs and setting public access and create. See, this is my RAG docs. Okay, inside this RAG docs, I can upload my document. So what I do for customizing or applying the RAG, I'll go to the chat playground. I'll clear the answer and I go to the add your data section. And here you can see an option for adding the custom data source. So I will select. We have different options for that. You can use the AI search, blob service, Cosmos DB, Elastic Search, or web URLs you can specify, or you can upload your files. So I'm using the upload files option because I have a PDF file with me in my local machine. So I'll select this. And now I have to upload my file into a blob container and use an AI search service to do a similarity search because AI search service is capable to search in the PDF document and find the matching answers. So the two things I need is, first of all, which container or storage account container I have to use. So I'll select the storage account. And then here I need a search service. So I can create a search service here. So let me go here and create a new search service. Maybe I can say RAG search. And if I'll create this in maybe, maybe, maybe Central India, where this storage account is, where this AI service is located. Maybe in US only. So I'm selecting the East US and the pricing tier. I need only the free tier or the basic tier I'll select. Then create. So I'm creating a search service. Because for performing the similarity search means to read the matching document, matching data from the PDF. It will require a search service. And that matching document is passed to the uh, AI model for creating the actual answer. You can see it is deploying the search service. Yes, you can see it's created. So I'll go back here and here I'll refresh and select the search service. And I need an index because there is, should be a search index. So I can give this as HP index I can use. And next, here I have to upload the file. So I can see browse for file upload. I can go and uh, select this HP user manual and then upload. See, this is uploaded and I'll say next. And this is doing a semantic search or keyword search. So I'll use a uh, keyword search I'll use. If you want, you can enable semantic search also. Okay, so semantic search will search based on the semantic meaning of the text. So I'll use uh, API key based uh, authentication to the search service. Because search service is connecting to the storage account for fetching the document. So we'll need to authenticate with the key and configure. So you can see now the indexing process is happening, means the search service reading 
the PDF documents and creating the search index. This may take a minute or two. That's it. So how many documents we have? Accordingly, the time may vary. So here we have only one document you can see. So it will finish in one or two minutes. Next. Okay, the processing completed for document, now generating the index. So here you can see the indexing is in progress. Yes, you can see that the index, that is HP index is created. And now we can start asking the question. So I will go and ask the same question which I have asked, like how to create recovery media and do the backup. So let's go here. How to create a recovery media and do the backup in SP laptops. Let's ask so this is the section and the answers are using this okay. using Windows tools. Okay. Let's see what is the answer generated. So here to create a recovery media and perform a backup on HP laptops, you can follow the steps outlined in the user guide. Here is a summary process for backing up. You can see create a recovery media and backup. It's a recommended to backup your hard drive by creating a recovery media. And you can see create creating HP recovery media selected products only. That is what you see here, right? creating recovery media on selected products only. And you can see the steps here, like uh, right click, start menu and file explorer and this PC, so and so. And the second option is using Windows tools. That is the next option we have, right, this one. So it given the answers, but if you, see below it is giving one reference link which means that the answer is coming from which document hp user manual it's not from the pre-trained memory now the answer is generated from the hp user manual okay the file which i have uploaded okay so you can even ask a different question if you want maybe This is very step by step process. Let's ask this question How to download this? I'm just asking this question. Let's see whether this will answer. So here say to determine the BIOS version before downloading the HPPC diagnostics. So let's see whether it is based on this. HP to download the latest EUFI version. In the HPPC diagnostic section, click on down, sorry, select the download link and run. Okay. 
So you can download this to a USB drive by following these instructions. So this answer you can see it is the summarized answer which is generated from this HP user manual, right? That means the questions which I am asking is answered based on the information found in this document. So this approach is called RAG, that is a Retrieval Augmented Generation. It's a very simple approach for customizing your model to work with our custom data. Now, if you see the Gen AI based applications, so there are lots of applications we are currently using in our uh, laptops as well as in the mobiles. First of all, the code generation tools like a GitHub Copilot or AWS Code Whisperer. So GitHub Copilot is a proprietary product from Microsoft and GitHub, and that you have to uh, purchase a subscription okay, on personal level or in business level or business account or business subscription or enterprise subscription or personal subscription to use it. So what is GitHub Copilot is doing? It is a code generator, means inside your editors, like a Visual Studio code, you can generate the code automatically based on the comments. Or you can see some auto suggestions for functions uh, in your editors and it support different languages. Same functionality is supported in AWS Code Whisperer, but Code Whisperer is a free tool. Okay, so but it does not provide the complete features offered by GitHub Copilot, which is very powerful. But AWS Code Whisperer is also able to give you the uh, code completions, code suggestions, but uh, it's not that powerful like a GitHub Copilot. Microsoft Copilot, which is now part of the uh, Windows operating system and the Bing or the browser, you can see here in the Windows operating system, we have the Copilot. So this is the Copilot. This is called Windows Copilot, which is now available in Windows operating system. Or we can go to browser and in the browser there is a copilot see there is now edge browser there is a copilot so you can ask questions here which is again similar to our windows copilot but this is a browser based copilot or if you go to the bing website there is a website which provides the copilot features suppose if you go to this open copilot you can see it goes to the bing.com. The bing.com is providing a copilot. There also you can ask your questions. So, copilot is a product or agent that is developed by Microsoft using this Gen AI features. So, we can use uh, that for image generations also. I have showed you the image generation using the Bing copilot. And Google search is now using the Gemini API that is previously called a BARD. Okay, now it is called a Gemini API. So when you do some search in the Google, it uses the Gen AI to generate the result summary. Okay, so in the Google, we can use uh, Adobe Photoshop AI for generating the images just using the prompt. So you can just uh, write a prompt. It will draw the image in Photoshop. Adobe Photoshop AI, if you search. Here they will, I think they are demonstrating something somewhere. 
see you can just select this area and you can say what to do okay so look at this example that they have this one select the area and you can convert that into jungle there is a pond you can create type jaguar and create so it creates a jaguar right so similarly there are a lot of things you can do with gen ai that's just uh, provide the instruction what to do it will automatically do that within your uh, image right so adobe photoshop is now using what the uh, generative ai so here you can see yellow b is generated in this area okay so that means now the image editing software is uses using the gen ai to enhance the image okay. and there are customer success bot that is glean ai's customer success bot available so there are in different uh, uh, applications currently available in uh, internet which uses the generative ai models suppose if you want to build an ai enabled application okay maybe you want to create uh, an AI service or AI application that uses the RAG approach for combining the generative AI with your custom data. So there are different uh, services you can integrate together to build that. For that, you can use a framework called the LangChain. So LangChain is a framework, Python or JavaScript framework, which you can use to build the AI application. And inside the LangChain that support multiple AI models. If you are interested, you can go with the open AI models or you can use the Llama or some other models which is available in Hugging Face. So Hugging Face is a, a model repository where you can see thousands of models for various operations so you can use the models from hugging face or you can use uh, the model which is provided by google or meta or microsoft okay. so along with the lang chain you can use the vector databases the vector databases can be mongodb uh, milvers or pinecone or some other and then you use the approach like a rag okay or you can use the search engines, uh, means search services like Azure AI search, okay. Or you can integrate that inside the chatbots, integrate into the search uh, tools like uh, we have already discussed. Google search is currently using the uh, generative AI, right? So you can integrate with the different applications, and it can now handle different types of data like image text, audio, and video. So this can be deployed into cloud or on-premise using various services like uh, uh, Azure Functions or AWS Lambda or the Vercel. And it can integrate with the different uh, storage services like AWS S3 or the Azure Blob Storage. Okay. So that means we can use uh, the, the, the various services to build an AI application. So mostly the developers prefer to use LangChain for building the custom AI applications where you can use different uh, models, either the Llama from Meta, or you can use uh, Gemini or OpenAI or some other models available in Hugging Face, along with the 
vector databases if you are using the RAG approach, that is retrieval augmented generation. And these applications can be hosted in the cloud. Okay. And this, suppose I have showed you an application which uh, I have created. This is the application. So here I have a chat uh, agent. So this is using the RAG approach. It's a database is hosted in the cloud. Okay. And this is actually a web application which is deployed in the cloud. So the backend AI service is hosted as a Python application and which is created using Langchain and that is published in the Azure Cloud. Okay. So this is the service that shows the information from my custom database. So this way we can integrate various services together to uh, build an AI application. Some of the real world scenarios, we can use the Gen AI in banking and finance, okay, for personal finance management and personalize the finance products, customer support automation via advanced chatbots, credit scoring with a greater accuracy in predicting client credit worthiness, account oversight, fraud detection, and the risk assessment. And in the insurance sectors, support in un underwriting uh, risk evaluation and claim investigation, automated processing of routine claims to expedite settlements like this. There are different use cases we can see in each domain. So I'm not reading each and everything, but yes, we can use it in banking and finance, insurance, high tech, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, uh, retail and commerce, education, manufacturing, capital markets, automotive, travel, customer goods and services. So that means in different domains, we can use the Gen AI services for various purposes. Now, coming to the final part of our session, that is ethical development of the AI applications. Obviously, when we build the AI applications, we have to follow some guidelines or we have to follow some principles. Because now, because the AI is very popular and we can build applications using AI services. There are lots of tools and services available for that. We cannot predict how people go and use this AI. Okay, so uh, you must have heard about a lot of incidents like uh, frauds, then fake, deep fake videos and images. Okay, then fake. Uh, calls, phone calls. Recently, there was an incident spotted that uh, a person is getting a call from another person and he's saying his uh, son is kidnapped and they are asking for the ransom money and they have uh, given the phone to uh, his son and uh, The father could hear the, the voice of his son that he was crying. The exact same voice. But after some time, he saw that his son was coming to home and he realized that the voice that he heard uh, over phone was actually a AI generated voice. But you saw that how the people are using the artificial intelligence. They created the voice of another person. Okay, they have, uh, they can use the face or the photo to create the fake videos of that person, right? So that now we cannot predict how people go and use the AI. So organizations like Microsoft, AWS, Google, and other 
uh, organization, they have created a list of principles, which we call as responsible AI principles that the AI developers or AI users needs to follow. So the common guidelines that uh, this is the AI responsible AI principles provided by uh, or offered by Microsoft like a uh, fairness, which means the challenge that we get in AI applications is there can be bias that may affect the result. For example, if there is a loan approval system that is discriminating the users by gender, okay, because the model is mostly trained with only one type of data. For example, if the model is trained with only the data set of male users, when a female customer comes and apply for a loan, it may automatically gets rejected because the model is only familiar with the male user data. Okay, so that will create a bias because another type of users requests are automatically rejected by the AI system because there is a bias. Okay, so that is uh, called a challenge in the uh, AI application because of uh, fairness. So we have to ma maintain fairness so that there will be no bias. Next is about reliability and safety. That means errors may cause harm. That means if there is a driverless vehicle and what will happen if a system failure happens means if something goes wrong. So there is no safety for the user, right? Because if the vehicle is failed or if it is making accident, okay, that will affect the passenger, right? So there should be safety and reliability. So that means you have to test the model in various conditions with the various type of data to ensure that it is reliable. Okay, suppose if you are testing this vehicle only in the smooth road or in the straight road, but what happens if the car goes in a curved road or if there is a hilly area? We have to ensure the reliability and safety of the customers or the you passenger, right? So we have to train the model with all type of data to ensure that it is reliable and safe. Next is privacy and security. These models, when, we, when you use inside your organization applications, that may handle the personal information of users, like uh, email, password, or maybe phone number, okay, or credit card numbers. So we have to make sure that the data is secured and it is not exposed to public. Okay. For example, the medical diagnostic bot is trained using the sensitive patient's data, which is stored insecurely. So if the data is not stored securely, the bot may uh, use that information and it will expose that information to public. Next is inclusiveness. That means when you create an AI solution, it should work for everyone. If it is not working for some type of users, then we cannot say it is following the inclusiveness principle. For example, a predictive app provides no audio output for visually impaired users. For example, we, ha we have a, a chatbot which allows only typing, okay, that text type of input. But what is the problem if the user is having some vision problem or he is having some color blindness? So he cannot see the screen and do the typing, right? So there should be a functionality for handling with the audio input and audio output. 
so that the user can use the microphone to speak so the audio will be given as the input which uh, helps the users to interact with the ai system similarly there should be an audio output okay so if we are providing only the text input process then it means we are not considering people who have uh, vision issues so we have to consider all types of users while building the AI application. Transparency means users must trust a complex system. For example, if there is an AI application which is doing financial recommendation or investment recommendations. So the question is on what basis it is giving this recommendation. You may have a lot of uh, share market applications like uh, Upstock, Grow, and all. So they will be giving a lot of recommendations. You can invest on this, you can invest on this, like that. But the question is on what basis it is saying it is good. So the AI system which is recommending something to the user also need to say, yes, we are recommending this to you because of this reasons. Yes, the last five years performance is good. That's the reason we are recommending this. So that means the recommendation system is just recommending the product is not good. Why they are recommending? So the user must be aware what is happening and why it is happening. Okay, so that is transparency. And the last is accountability, which says, who will be liable for the AI driven decisions? So when you build an AI application, based on that decisions taken by the AI system, user will be doing something. For example, if the user is investing on a particular a mutual fund or share based on the recommendations given by the application, but what happens if he loses his money? Who is accountable for that? Right. So there should be a clear definition. Who will be liable for the decisions taken by the AI system? So suppose if the developer is saying, no, I am not re responsible. If the company who provided the application is saying, no, I am not responsible for that. Then who will be responsible? So there should be a clear definition that who will be responsible for the decisions taken by the AI systems. Okay, so that means when you build an AI based applications, you have to follow all these principles for building an effective AI application. So that's it from my side. And now if you have any questions, you can post your questions in the chat. I will try to answer uh, at the best. Hello participants, if you have any questions, you can put your questions in the chat.
here is the slide which you have asked, which is talking about the different tools for building the AI application. So if you are planning to build the AI applications and interact with the LLM models, you can use the framework called the LangChain, or you can use the semantic kernel, which is from Microsoft that uses the C sharp language. And the uh, Microsoft Learn modules available for learning about the uh, open AI services available in Microsoft. So you can search for Microsoft to learn for generative AI. I'll share the link for that. So I'll be sharing the link for Microsoft Learn website, which will give you a good understanding about the Gen AI services. Guys, before leaving the session, make sure you fill this feedback form. I already shared on chat box.